societies dominated by modern conditions of production, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has receded into a representation. The images detached from every aspect of life merge into a common stream in which the unity of that life can no longer be recovered. Fragmented views of reality regroup themselves into a new unity as a separate pseudo-world that can only be looked at. The specialization of images of the world evolves into a world of autonomized images where even the deceivers are deceived. The spectacle is a concrete inversion of life, an autonomous movement of the non-living. The spectacle presents itself simultaneously as society itself, as a part of society, and as a means of unification. As a part of society, it is the focal point of all vision and all consciousness. But due to the very fact that this sector is separate, it is in reality the domain of delusion and false consciousness. The unification it achieves is nothing but an official language of universal separation. Nous avons, à la fin de ces délibérations, apprécié ce qui était positif et mis en évidence aussi qu'il restait encore beaucoup à faire. The spectacle is not a collection of images, it is a social relation between people that is mediated by images. Understood in its totality, the spectacle is both the result and the project of the dominant mode of production. It is not a mere decoration added to the real world. It is the very heart of this real society's unreality. In all of its particular manifestations, news, propaganda, advertising, entertainment, the spectacle represents the dominant model of life. It is the omnipresent affirmation of the choices that have already been made in the sphere of production and in the consumption implied by that production. Separation is itself an integral part of the unity of this world, of a global social practice split into reality and image. The social practice confronted by an autonomous spectacle is at the same time the real totality which contains that spectacle but the split within this totality mutilates it to the point that the spectacle seems to be its goal. In a world that is really upside down, the true is a moment of the false. Considered in its own terms, the spectacle is an affirmation of appearances and an identification of all human social life with appearances but a critique that grasps the spectacle's essential character reveals it to be a visible negation of life, a negation that has taken on a visible form. The spectacle presents itself as a vast, inaccessible reality that can never be questioned. Its sole message is, what appears is good, what is good appears. The passive acceptance it demands is already effectively imposed by its monopoly of appearances, its manner of appearing without allowing any reply. The spectacle is able to subject human beings to itself because the economy has already totally subjected them. It is nothing other than the economy developing for itself. It is at once a faithful reflection of the production of things and a distorting objectification of the producers. When the real world is transformed into mere images, mere images become real beings, dynamic figments that provide the direct motivations for a hypnotic behavior. As long as necessity is socially dreamed, dreaming will remain a social necessity. The spectacle is the bad dream of a modern society in chains and ultimately expresses nothing more than its wish for sleep. The spectacle is the guardian of that sleep. The fact that the practical power of modern society has detached itself from that society and established an independent realm in the spectacle can be explained only by the additional fact 
that the powerful practice continued to lack cohesion and had remained in contradiction with itself. The root of the spectacle is that oldest of all social specializations, the specialization of power. The spectacle plays the specialized role of speaking in the name of all other activities. It is hierarchical society's ambassador to itself, delivering its official messages at a court where no one else is allowed to speak. The most modern aspect of the spectacle is thus also the most archaic. The social separation reflected in the spectacle is inseparable from the modern state, the product of the social division of labor that is both the chief instrument of class rule and the concentrated expression of all social divisions. In the spectacle, a part of the world represents itself to the world and is superior to it. The spectacle is simply the common language of this separation. Spectators are linked solely by their one-way relationship to the very center that keeps them isolated from each other. The spectacle thus reunites the separated, but it reunites them only in their separateness. Workers do not produce themselves. They produce a power independent of themselves. The success of this production, the abundance it generates, is experienced by the producers as an abundance of dispossession. As their alienated products accumulate, all time and space become foreign to them. The forces that have escaped us display themselves to us in all their power. Though separated from what they produce, people nevertheless produce every detail of their world with ever-increasing power. They thus also find themselves increasingly separated from that world. The closer their life comes to being their own creation, the more they are excluded from that life. The spectacle is capital accumulated to the point that it becomes images. Critical theory must communicate itself in its own language, the language of contradiction, which must be dialectical in both form and content. It must be an all-inclusive critique, and it must be grounded in history. It is not a zero degree of writing, but its reversal. It is not a negation of style, but the style of negation. The very style of dialectical theory is a scandal and abomination to the prevailing standards of language and to the sensibilities molded by those standards, because while it makes concrete use of existing concepts, it simultaneously recognizes their fluidity and their inevitable destruction. This style, which includes a critique of itself, must express the domination of the present critique over its entire past. Dialectical theory's mode of exposition reveals the negative spirit within it. Truth is not like some finished product in which one can no longer find any trace of the tool that made it. This theoretical consciousness of a movement, whose traces must remain visible within it, is manifested by the reversal of established relationships between concepts and by the determinement of all the achievements of earlier critical efforts. Ideas improve. The meaning of words plays a role in that improvement. Plagiarism is necessary. Progress depends on it. It sticks close to an author's phrasing, exploits his expressions, deletes a false idea, replaces it with the right one. Determinant is the flexible language of anti-ideology. It appears in communication that knows it cannot claim to embody any definitive certainty. It is language that cannot and need not be confirmed by any previous or supercritical reference. On the contrary, its own internal coherence and practical effectiveness are what validate the previous kernels of truth that has brought back into play. Determinant has grounded its cause on nothing but its own truth as present critique. The element of overt determinant in formulated theory refutes any notion that such theory is durably autonomous. 
by introducing into the theoretical domain the same type of violent subversion that disrupts and overthrows every existing order. Determinant serves as a reminder that theory is nothing in itself, that it can realize itself only through historical action and through the historical correction that is its true allegiance. The point is to actually participate in the community of dialogue and the game with time that up till now have been merely represented by poetic and artistic works. When art becomes independent and paints its world in dazzling colors, a moment of life has grown old. Such a moment cannot be rejuvenated by dazzling colors. It can only be evoked in memory. The greatness of art only emerges at the dusk of light. Having fun, Mr. Logan? I couldn't sleep. That stuff help any? Makes the night go faster. What's keeping you awake? Dreams. Bad dreams. Yeah, I get them sometimes, too. This will chase him away. I tried that. Didn't seem to help me any. How many men have you forgotten? As many women as you remember. The official thought of the social organization of appearances is itself obscured by the generalized subcommunication that it has to defend. It cannot understand that conflict is at the origin of everything in its world. The specialists of spectacular power, a power that is absolute within its realm of one-way communication, are absolutely corrupted by their experience of contempt and by the success of that contempt because they find their contempt confirmed by their awareness of how truly contemptible spectators really are. In the spectacle's basic practice of incorporating into itself all the fluid aspects of human activity so as to possess them in a congealed form and of inverting living values into purely abstract values we recognize our old enemy, the commodity, which seems at first glance so trivial and obvious, yet which is actually so complex and full of metaphysical subtleties. The fetishism of the commodity, the domination of society by intangible as well as tangible things, attains its ultimate fulfillment in the spectacle, where the real world is replaced by a selection of images which are projected above it, yet which at the same time succeed in making themselves regarded as the epitome of reality. The world at once present and absence that the spectacle holds up to view is the world of the commodity dominating all living experience. The world of the commodity is thus shown for what it is, 
because its development is identical to people's estrangement from each other and from everything they produce. As long as the economy's role as material basis of social life was neither noticed nor understood, remaining unknown precisely because it was so familiar, the commodity's dominion over the economy was exerted in a covert manner. In societies where actual commodities were few and far between, money was the apparent master, serving as plenipotentiary representative of the greater power that remained unknown. With the Industrial Revolution's manufactural division of labor and mass production for a global market, the commodity finally became fully visible as a power that was colonizing all social life. It was at that point that political economy established itself as the dominant science and as the science of domination. The spectacle is a permanent opium war designed to force people to equate goods with commodities and to equate satisfaction with a survival that expands according to its own laws. Consumable survival must constantly expand because it never ceases to include privation. If augmented survival never comes to a resolution, if there is no point where it might stop expanding, this is because it is itself stuck in the realm of privation. It may gild poverty, but it cannot transcend it. Exchange value could arise only as a representative of use value, but the victory it eventually won, with its own weapons, created the conditions for its own autonomous power. By mobilizing all human use value and monopolizing its fulfillment, exchange value ultimately succeeded in controlling use. Usefulness has come to be seen purely in terms of exchange value and is now completely at its mercy. Starting out like a condottiere in the service of use value, exchange value has ended up waging the war for its own sake. Use value was formerly understood as an implicit aspect of exchange value. Now, however, within the upside-down world of the spectacle, it must be explicitly proclaimed, both because its actual reality has been eroded by the overdeveloped commodity economy, and because it serves as a necessary pseudo-justification for a counterfeit life. With the achievement of economic abundance, the concentrated result of social labor becomes visible, subjecting all reality to the appearances that are now that labor's primary product. Capital is no longer the invisible center governing the production process. As it accumulates, it spreads to the ends of the earth in the form of tangible objects. The entire expanse of society is its portrait. The spectacle, like modern society itself, is at once united and divided. The unity of each is based on violent divisions. But when this contradiction emerges in the spectacle, it is itself contradicted by a reversal of its meaning. The division it presents is unitary, while the unity it presents is divided. Although the struggles between different powers for control of the same socio-economic system are officially presented as irreconcilable antagonisms, they actually reflect that system's fundamental unity, both internationally and within each nation. The sham, spectacular struggles between rival forms of separate power are at the same time real, in that they express the system's uneven and conflictual development and the more or less contradictory interests of the classes or sections of classes that accept that system and strive to carve out a role for themselves within it. By invoking any number of different criteria, the spectacle can present these oppositions as totally distinct social systems. But in reality, they are nothing but particular sectors whose fundamental essence lies in the global system that contains them, the single movement that has turned the whole planet into its field of operation, capitalism. 
Behind the glitter of spectacular distractions, a tendency toward banalization dominates modern society the world over. Even where the more advanced forms of commodity consumption have seemingly multiplied the variety of roles and objects to choose from. The vestiges of religion and of the family, the latter is still the primary mechanism for transferring class power from one generation to the next, along with the vestiges of moral repression imposed by those two institutions, can be blended with ostentatious pretensions of worldly gratification, precisely because life in this particular world remains repressive and offers nothing but pseudo-gratifications. Complacent acceptance of the status quo may also coexist with purely spectacular rebelliousness. Dissatisfaction itself becomes a commodity as soon as the economy of abundance develops the capacity to process that particular raw material. Stars, spectacular representations of living human beings, project this general banality into images of permitted roles. As specialists of apparent life, stars serve as superficial objects that people can identify with in order to compensate for the fragmented productive specializations that they actually live. The function of these celebrities is to act out various lifestyles or socio-political viewpoints in a full, totally free manner. They embody the inaccessible results of social labor by dramatizing the byproducts of that labor, which are magically projected above it as its ultimate goals, power and vacations, the decision-making and consumption that are at the beginning and the end of a process that is never questioned. On one hand, a governmental power may personalize itself as a pseudo-star. On the other, a star of consumption may campaign for recognition as a pseudo-power over life. But the activities of these stars are not really free, and they offer no real choices. Spectacular oppositions conceal the unity of poverty. If different forms of the same alienation struggle against each other in the guise of irreconcilable antagonisms, this is because they are all based on real contradictions that are repressed. The spectacle exists in a concentrated form and a diffuse form. Depending on the requirements of the particular stage of poverty, it denies and supports. In both cases, it is nothing more than an image of happy harmony, surrounded by desolation and horror at the calm center of misery. The concentrated spectacle is primarily associated with bureaucratic capitalism, though it may also be imported as a technique for reinforcing state power in more backward-mixed economies, or even adopted by advanced capitalism during certain moments of crisis. Bureaucratic property is itself concentrated in that the individual bureaucrat takes part in the ownership of the entire economy only through his membership in the community of bureaucrats. And since commodity production is less developed under bureaucratic capitalism, it too takes on a concentrated form. The commodity the bureaucracy appropriates is the total social labor and what it sells back to the society is that society's wholesale survival. The dictatorship of the bureaucratic economy cannot leave the exploited masses any significant margin of choice because it has had to make all the choices itself, and any choice made independently of it, whether regarding food or music or anything else, thus amounts to a declaration of war against it. The diffuse spectacle is associated with commodity abundance, with the undisturbed development of modern capitalism. Here, each individual commodity is justified in the name of the grandeur of the total commodity production, of which the spectacle is a laudatory catalog. Irreconcilable claims jockey for position on the stage of the affluent economy's unified spectacle and different star commodities simultaneously promote conflicting social policies. 
The automobile spectacle, for example, strives for a perfect traffic flow entailing the destruction of old urban districts, while the city spectacle needs to preserve those districts as tourist attractions. The already dubious satisfaction alleged to be obtained from the consumption of the whole is thus constantly being disappointed because the actual consumer can directly access only a succession of fragments of this commodity heaven. Fragments which invariably lack the quality attributed to the whole. Each individual commodity fights for itself. It avoids acknowledging the others and strives to impose itself everywhere as if it were the only one in existence. The spectacle is the epic poem of this struggle, a struggle that no fall of Troy can bring to an end. The spectacle does not sing of men and their arms, but of commodities and their passions. In this blind struggle, each commodity, by pursuing its own passion, unconsciously generates something beyond itself, the globalization of the commodity, which also amounts to the commodification of the globe. Thus, as a result of the cunning of the commodity, while each particular manifestation of the commodity eventually falls in battle, the general commodity form continues onward toward its absolute realization. The image of blissful social unification through consumption merely postpones the consumer's awareness of the actual divisions until his next disillusionment with some particular commodity. Each new product is ceremoniously acclaimed as a unique creation, offering a dramatic shortcut to the promised land of total consummation. But as with the fashionable adoption of seemingly aristocratic first names, which end up being given to virtually all individuals of the same age, the objects that promise uniqueness can be offered up for mass consumption only if they have been mass produced. The prestigiousness of mediocre objects of this kind is solely due to the fact that they have been placed, however briefly, at the center of social life and hailed as a revelation of the unfathomable purposes of production. But the object that was prestigious in the spectacle becomes mundane as soon as it is taken home by its consumer and by all its other consumers. Too late, it reveals its essential poverty, a poverty that inevitably reflects the poverty of its production. Meanwhile, some other object is already replacing it as representative of the system and demanding its own moment of acclaim. The fraudulence of the satisfactions offered by the system is exposed by this continual replacement of products and of general conditions of production. In both, the diffuse and the concentrated spectacle, entities that have brazenly asserted their definitive perfection nevertheless end up changing, and only the system endures. Stalin, like any other outmoded commodity, is denounced by the very forces that originally promoted him. Each new lie of the advertising industry is an admission of its previous lie and with each downfall of a personification of totalitarian power, the illusory community that had unanimously approved him is exposed as a mere conglomeration of loners without illusions. The things the spectacle presents as eternal are based on change, and must change as their foundations change. The spectacle is totally dogmatic, yet it is incapable of arriving at any really solid dogma. Nothing stands still for it. This instability is the spectacle's natural condition, but it is completely contrary to its inclination. The unreal unity proclaimed by the spectacle masks the class division underlying the real unity of the capitalist mode of production. What obliges the producers to participate in the construction of the world is also what excludes them from it. What brings people into relation with each other by liberating them from their local and national limitations is also what keeps them apart. What requires increased rationality is also what nourishes the irrationality of hierarchical exploitation and repression. 
What produces society's abstract power also produces its concrete lack of freedom. production has unified space, breaking down the boundaries between one society and the next. This unification is at the same time an extensive and intensive process of banalization. Just as the accumulation of commodities mass-produced for the abstract space of the market shattered all regional and legal barriers, and all the medieval guild restrictions that maintain the quality of craft production, it also undermined the autonomy and quality of places. This homogenizing power is the heavy artillery that has battered down all the walls of China. The free space of commodities is constantly being altered and redesigned in order to become ever more identical to itself, to get as close as possible to motionless monotony. While eliminating geographical distance, this society produces a new internal distance in the form of spectacular separation. Tourism Human circulation packaged for consumption, a byproduct of the circulation of commodities, is the opportunity to go and see what has been banalized. The economic organization of travel to different places already guarantees their equivalence. The modernization that has eliminated the time involved in travel has simultaneously eliminated any real space from it. The society that reshapes its entire surroundings has evolved its own special technique for molding its own territory, which constitutes the material underpinning for all the facets of this project. Urbanism, city planning, is capitalism's method for taking over the natural and human environment. Following its logical development toward total domination, capitalism now can and must refashion the totality of space into its own particular decor. While all the technical forces of capitalism contribute toward various forms of separation, urbanism provides the material foundation for those forces and prepares the ground for their deployment. It is the very technology of separation. In all previous periods, architectural innovations were designed exclusively for the ruling classes. Now, for the first time, a new architecture has been specifically designed for the poor. The aesthetic poverty and vast proliferation of this new experience in habitation stem from its mass character, which character in turn stems from both its function and from the modern conditions of construction. The obvious core of these conditions is the authoritarian decision-making, which abstractly converts the environment into an environment of abstraction. Urbanism is one of the most glaring expressions of the contradiction between the growth of society's material powers and the continued lack of progress toward any conscious control of those powers.
The history that threatens this twilight world could potentially subject space to a directly experienced time. Proletarian revolution is this critique of human geography through which individuals and communities could create places and events commensurate with the appropriation no longer just of their work, but of their entire history. The ever-changing playing field of this new world and the freely chosen variations in the rules of the game will regenerate a diversity of local scenes that are independent without being insular and this diversity will in turn revive the possibility of authentic journeys, journeys within an authentic life that is itself understood as a journey containing its whole meaning within itself. your pleasure. Whiskey. Java, Sumatra, Hindu, Chinese, Portuguese, Filipinos, Russians, Malaya. What a witch's Sabbath. If anyone saw us coming in here, I'd certainly hear plenty. The other places like kindergartens compared with this. Smell so incredibly evil. I didn't think such a place existed except in my own imagination. It has a ghastly familiarity like a half remembered dream. Anything could happen here. Any moment. The time of production, commodified time, is an infinite accumulation of equivalent intervals. It is irreversible time made abstract in which each segment need only demonstrate by the clock its purely quantitative equality with all the others. It has no reality apart from its exchangeability. This general time of human non-development also has a complementary aspect, a consumable form of time based on the present mode of production and presenting itself in everyday life as a pseudo-cyclical time. Pseudo-cyclical time is associated with the consumption of modern economic survival, the augmented survival in which everyday experience is cut off from decision-making and subjected no longer to the natural order but to the pseudo-nature created by alienated labor. It is thus quite natural that it echoes the old cyclical rhythm that governs survival in pre-industrial societies, incorporating the natural vestiges of cyclical time while generating new variants. Day and night, work and weekend, periodic vacations. Consumable pseudo-cyclical time is spectacular time, both in the narrow sense as time spent consuming images and in the broader sense as image of the consumption of time. The time spent consuming images, images which in turn serve to publicize all the other commodities, is both the particular terrain where the spectacle's mechanisms are most fully implemented and the general goal that those mechanisms present, the focus and epitome of all particular consumptions. 
As for the social image of the consumption of time, it is exclusively dominated by leisure time and vacations, moments portrayed like all spectacular commodities at a distance and as desirable by definition. These commodified moments are explicitly presented as moments of real life whose cyclical return we are supposed to look forward to. But all that is really happening is that the spectacle is displaying and reproducing itself at a higher level of intensity. What is presented as true life turns out to be merely a more truly spectacular life. While the consumption of cyclical time in ancient societies was consistent with the real labor of those societies, the pseudo-cyclical consumption of developed economies contradicts the abstract, irreversible time implicit in their system of production. Cyclical time was the really lived time of unchanging illusions. Spectacular time is the illusory lived time of a constantly changing reality. The production processes' constant innovations are not echoed in consumption, which presents nothing but an expanded repetition of the past. Because dead labor continues to dominate living labor, in spectacular time the past continues to dominate the present. The lack of general historical life also means that individual life as yet has no history. The pseudo-events that vie for attention in spectacular dramatizations have not been lived by those who are informed about them, and in any case they are soon forgotten due to their increasingly frenetic replacement at every pulsation of the spectacular machinery. Conversely, what is really lived has no relation to the society's official version of irreversible time and conflicts with the pseudo-cyclical rhythm of that time's consumable byproducts. This individual experience of a disconnected everyday life remains without language, without concepts, and without critical access to its own past, which has nowhere been recorded, uncommunicated, misunderstood, and forgotten. It is smothered by the spectacle's false memory of the unmemorable. The way it goes, lose one, find one. Play something for me, Mr. Guitar. Anything special? Just put a lot of love in it. He ain't gonna play so good all stretched out on that crap table. What's eating the fancy man? I don't know. What's your trouble, kid? I'm in no trouble. He is. Fooling with a strange woman can bring a man a lot of grief. You a strange woman? Only to strangers. What's going on with you two? Just what you see, friend. Oh, you picked the wrong place to come to, mister. Well, the lady sent for me, not you. Heads, I'm gonna kill you, mister. Tails, you can play her a tune. Play me a tune. something else. The spectacle, considered as the reigning society's method for paralyzing history and memory and for suppressing any history based on historical time, represents a false consciousness of time. Behind the fashions that come and go on the frivolous surface of the spectacle of pseudo-cyclical time, the grand style of an era can always be found in what is governed by the secret yet obvious necessity for revolution.
Gracie is my very best friend, Omar, Miss Poppy Smith. And you? Are you an Egyptian, Comprador? No, I'm a doctor. Dr. Omar of Shanghai and Gomorrah. Any relation to the poet, Omar? A book of verses underneath the brow? A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. You said Dr. Omar. Doctor of what? Doctor of nothing, Miss Smith. It sounds important and hurts no one, unlike most doctors. And your Bernouche, is it as real as your title? Where were you born? My birth took place under a full moon on the sands near Damascus. My father was an Armenian tobacco dealer and was far away. And my mother, the less said about her, the better. She was half French, and the other half is lost in the dust of time. In short, I'm a thoroughbred mongrel. I'm related to all the earth and nothing that's human is foreign to me. Then perhaps you can explain how our friend suddenly vanished. We were alone since I first saw you. Examining history amounts to examining the nature of power. Greece was the moment when power and changes in power were first debated and understood. It was a democracy of the masters of society, a total contrast to the despotic state where power settles accounts only with itself, within the impenetrable obscurity of its inner sanctum, by means of palace revolutions which are beyond the pale of discussion, whether they fail or succeed. The dry, unexplained chronology that a deified authority offered to its subjects, who were supposed to accept it as the earthly fulfillment of mythic commandments, was destined to be transcended and transformed into conscious history. But for this to happen, sizable groups of people had to have experienced real participation in history. Out of this practical communication between those who have recognized each other as possessors of a unique present who have experienced a qualitative richness of events in their own activity and who are at home in their own era, arises the general language of historical communication. Those for whom irreversible time truly exists discover in it both the memorable and the threat of oblivion. Herodotus of Holocarnassus here presents the result of his researches so that time will not abolish the deeds of men. Be prepared to remain all winter. All next winter, if necessary. I waited a long time for that order, sir. Which, of course, I didn't hear. Of course you didn't hear. If you fail, I assure you, the members of your court-martial will be the men who rode with us down to Shenandoah. 
I'll hand pick them myself. Shenandoah. I wonder what history will say about Shenandoah. The victory of the bourgeoisie is the victory of a profoundly historical time because it is the time corresponding to an economic production that continuously transforms society from top to bottom. So long as agrarian production remains the predominant form of labor, the cyclical time that remains at the base of society reinforces the joint forces of tradition, which tend to hold back any historical movement. But the irreversible time of the bourgeois economy eradicates those vestiges throughout the world. History, which until then had seemed to involve only the actions of individual members of the ruling class, and which had thus been recorded as a mere chronology of events, is now understood as a general movement, a relentless movement that crushes any individual in its path. By discovering its basis in political economy, history becomes aware of what had previously been unconscious. But this basis remains unconscious because it cannot be brought to light. This blind prehistory, this new fate that no one controls, is the only thing that the commodity economy has democratized. The bourgeoisie has thus made irreversible historical time known and has imposed it on society, but it has prevented society from using it. Once there was history, but not any more, because the class of owners of the economy, which is inextricably tied to economic history, must repress every other irreversible use of time because it is directly threatened by them. The ruling class, made up of specialists in the possession of things, who are themselves therefore possessed by things, is forced to link its fate with the preservation of this reified history, that is, with the preservation of a new immobility within history. Meanwhile, the worker at the base of society is for the first time not materially estranged from history, because the irreversible movement is now generated from that base. By demanding to live the historical time that it produces, the proletariat discovers the simple, unforgettable core of its revolutionary project. And each previously defeated attempt to carry out this project represents a possible point of departure for a new historical life. With the development of capitalism, irreversible time has become globally unified. Universal history becomes a reality because the entire world is brought under the sway of this time's development. But this history, that is everywhere simultaneously the same, is as yet nothing but an intra-historical rejection of history. What appears the world over as the same day is merely the time of economic production, time cut up into equal abstract fragments. This unified irreversible time belongs to the global market and thus also to the global spectacle. The irreversible time of production is first of all the measure of commodities, the time officially recognized throughout the world as the general time of society actually only reflects the specialized interests that constitute it, and thus is merely one particular type of time. The class struggles of the long era of revolutions initiated by the rise of the bourgeoisie have developed in tandem with the dialectical thought of history the thought which is no longer content to seek the meaning of what exists, but which strives to comprehend the dissolution of what exists and in the process breaks down every separation. This historical thought is still a consciousness that always arrives too late, a consciousness that can only formulate retrospective justifications of what has already happened. It has thus gone beyond separation only in thought. Hegel's paradoxical stance, his subordination of the meaning of all reality to its historical culmination, while at the same time proclaiming that his own system represents that culmination, flows from the simple fact that this thinker of the bourgeois revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries sought in his philosophy only a reconciliation with the results of those revolutions. Hey. Stop. 
давай проклятием заклеенный, без мира голодных мировых, и вида хану возмущенный, и смерти бой и зато. When the proletariat demonstrates through its own actions that this historical thought has not been forgotten, its refutation of that thought's conclusion is, at the same time, a confirmation of its method. The weakness of Marx's theory is naturally linked to the weakness of the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat of his time. The German working class failed to inaugurate a permanent revolution in 1848. The Paris Commune was defeated in isolation. As a result, revolutionary theory could not yet be fully realized. The theoretical shortcomings of the scientific defense of proletarian revolution both in its content and in its form of exposition, all ultimately result from identifying the proletariat with the bourgeoisie with respect to the revolutionary seizure of power. Hello, Goltz? From Jordan? Yes, read it. What? Too late, Duva. That means we're done for. This time we failed. Too bad. Yes. Too bad. The only two classes that really correspond to Marx's theory, the two pure classes that the entire analysis of capital brings to the fore, are the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. These are also the only two revolutionary classes in history, but operating under very different conditions. The bourgeois revolution is done. The proletarian revolution is a yet unrealized project, born on the foundation of the earlier revolution, but differing from it qualitatively. If one overlooks the originality of the historical role of the bourgeoisie, one also tends to overlook the specific originality of the proletarian project, which can achieve nothing unless it carries its own banners and recognizes the immensity of its own tasks. The bourgeoisie came to power because it was the class of the developing economy. The proletariat cannot create its own new form of power except by becoming the class of consciousness. The growth of productive forces will not in itself guarantee the emergence of such a power, not even indirectly by way of the increasing dispossession which that growth entails. Nor can a Jacobin-style seizure of the state be a means to this end. The proletariat cannot make use of any ideology designed to disguise its partial goals as general goals, because the proletariat cannot preserve any partial reality that is truly its own. This ideologically alienated theory was then no longer able to recognize the practical verifications of the unitary historical thought it had betrayed when such verifications emerged in spontaneous working-class struggles. Instead, it contributed toward repressing every manifestation and memory of them. Yet those historical forms that took shape in struggle were precisely the practical terrain that was needed in order to validate the theory. They were what the theory needed, yet that need had not been formulated theoretically. The Soviet, for example, was not a theoretical discovery and the most advanced theoretical truth of the International Working Men's Association was its own existence and practice. <laughs>
historical moment when Bolshevism triumphed for itself in Russia and social democracy fought victoriously for the old world marks the inauguration of the state of affairs that is at the heart of the modern spectacle's domination. The representation of the working class has become an enemy of the working class. The Stalin era revealed the bureaucracy's ultimate function, continuing the reign of the economy by preserving the essence of market society, commodified labor. It also demonstrated the independence of the economy. The economy has come to dominate society so completely that it has proved capable of recreating the class domination it needs for its own continued operation. That is, the bourgeoisie has created an independent power that is capable of maintaining itself, even without a bourgeoisie. The totalitarian bureaucracy was not the last owning class in history in Bruno Rizzi's sense. It was merely a substitute ruling class for the commodity economy. A tottering capitalist property system was replaced by a cruder version of itself. Simplified, less diversified, and concentrated as the collective property of the bureaucratic class. This underdeveloped type of ruling class is also a reflection of economic underdevelopment. It has no agenda beyond overcoming this underdevelopment in certain regions of the world. The hierarchical and statist framework for this crude remake of the capitalist ruling class was provided by the working class party, which was itself modeled on the hierarchical separations of bourgeois organizations. The ruling totalitarian ideological class is the ruler of a world turned upside down. The more powerful the class, the more it claims not to exist, and its power is employed above all to enforce this claim. It is modest only on this one point, however, because this officially non-existent bureaucracy simultaneously attributes the crowning achievements of history to its own infallible leadership. Though its existence is everywhere in evidence, the bureaucracy must be invisible as a class. As a result, all social life becomes insane. The social organization of total falsehood stems from this fundamental contradiction. Stalinism was also a reign of terror within the bureaucratic class. The terrorism on which this class's power was based inevitably came to strike the class itself, because this class had no juridical legitimacy, no legally recognized status as an owning class that could be extended to each of its members. Its ownership had to be masked because it was based on false consciousness. This false consciousness can maintain its total power only by means of a total reign of terror in which all real motives are ultimately obscured. The members of the ruling bureaucratic class have the right of ownership over society only collectively as participants in a fundamental lie. They have to play the role of the proletariat governing a socialist society. They have to be actors faithful to a script of ideological betrayal. Yet they cannot actually participate in this counterfeit entity unless their legitimacy is validated. No bureaucrat can individually assert his right to power, because to prove himself a socialist proletarian, he would have to demonstrate that he was the opposite of a bureaucrat, while to prove himself a bureaucrat is impossible, because the bureaucracy's official line is that there is no bureaucracy. Each bureaucrat is thus totally dependent on the central seal of legitimacy provided by the ruling ideology, which validates the collective participation in its socialist regime of all the bureaucrats it does not liquidate. 
Although the bureaucrats are collectively empowered to make all social decisions, the cohesion of their own class can be ensured only by the concentration of their terrorist power in a single person. In this person resides the only practical truth of the ruling lie, the power to determine an unchallengeable boundary line which is nevertheless constantly being adjusted. Stalin decides without appeal who is and who is not a member of the ruling bureaucracy, who should be considered a proletarian in power, and who branded a traitor in the pay of Wall Street and the Mikado. The atomized bureaucrats can find their collective legitimacy only in the person of Stalin, the lord of the world who thus comes to see himself as the absolute person for whom no superior spirit exists. The lord of the world recognizes his own nature, omnipresent power, through the destructive violence he exerts against the contrastingly powerless selfhood of his subjects. He is the power that defines the terrain of domination, and he is also the power that ravages that terrain. Das ist das Lied von der roten Fahne, die den entbrennenden Morgen verkündet, die über Länder und Ozeane aller bedrängten Herzen entzündet. Einmal nach all den Stürmen, wenn sich die Blutnacht erhält, Rauscht sie von allen Türmen einer eroberten Welt. Genossen, eine alarmierende Nachricht. Der Deutsche Reichstag steht in Flammen. <lacht> Noch sind keine Einzelheiten bekannt, aber schon verbreitet der faschistische Rundfunk über alle Sender die Behauptung, Kommunisten hätten den Reichstag angezündet. In Wirklichkeit handelt es sich um eine groß angelegte, ungeheuerliche Provokation der Nazi-Regierung. Die Versammlung ist aufgelöst. Der Reichstag brennt. Die Nazis haben Vorwand, den sie brauchen. Die Versammlung ist aufgelöst. Sie wollen unsere Partei verbieten. Sie wollen die Stimme der Arbeiterklasse ersticken. Aber das wird ihnen nicht gelingen. Solange es Kommunisten in Deutschland gibt, Und es wird die Himmel geben, solange wird der Kampf gegen Hitler nicht aufhören. Wir kämpfen für den Frieden aller Völker, den Hitler genossen. Hitler heißt Krieg!
When the proletariat discovers that its own externalized power contributes to the constant reinforcement of capitalist society, no longer only in the form of its alienated labor, but also in the form of the trade unions, political parties, and state powers that it had created in the effort to liberate itself, it also discovers, through concrete historical experience, that it is the class that must totally oppose all rigidified externalizations and all specializations of power. It bears a revolution that cannot leave anything outside itself, a revolution embodying the permanent domination of the present over the past, and a total critique of separation, and it must discover the appropriate forms of action to carry out this revolution. No quantitative amelioration of its impoverishment, no illusory participation in a hierarchized system, can provide a lasting cure for its dissatisfaction because the proletariat cannot truly recognize itself in any particular wrong it has suffered, nor in the writing of any particular wrong. It cannot recognize itself even in the writing of many such wrongs, but only in the writing of the absolute wrong of being excluded from any real life. <laughs>
New signs of negation are proliferating in the most economically advanced countries. Although these signs are misunderstood and falsified by the spectacle, they are sufficient proof that a new period has begun. We have already seen the failure of the first proletarian assault against capitalism. Now we are witnessing the failure of capitalist abundance. On the one hand, anti-union struggles of Western workers are being repressed, first of all, by the unions. On the other, rebellious youth are raising new protests, protests which are still vague and confused, but which clearly imply a rejection of art, of everyday life, and of the old specialized politics. These are two sides of a new spontaneous struggle that is, at first, taking on a criminal appearance. They foreshadow a second proletarian assault against class society. Remember me. I never remember pretty women. It's so expensive. But my Japanese cameras. There, I can't help you. Von Straten, has he got a new boat? This is not about business, Mr. Tadeo. We just want you to do us a favor. I never do favors. We only want a little information about Poland. I'll never give in. Poland. As capitalism's ever-intensifying imposition of alienation at all levels makes it increasingly hard for workers to recognize and name their own impoverishment, putting them in the position of having to reject that impoverishment in its totality or not at all, revolutionary organization has had to learn that it can no longer combat alienation by means of alienated forms of struggle. The development of class society to the stage of the spectacular organization of non-life is thus leading the revolutionary project to become visibly what it has always been in essence. Revolutionary theory is now the enemy of all revolutionary ideology, and it knows it. a toast in Georgian style, Luigi. How did you recognize me? <laughs> I know you. 
Your glasses are friends. In Georgian coast, the little story always comes first. I had a dream. I found myself in a graveyard where all the tombstones were marked in a curious way. 1822, 1826, 1930, 34, always like that, always a very short time between birth and death. In the graveyard, there was a very old man. I asked him how it was that he had lived so long when everyone else in his village had died so young. But no, he told me this. Not that we die early, it is just that here on our tombstones we do not count the years of a man's life. But rather the length of time he's kept a friend. Let's drink to friendship. Charge! 